By some estimates, fed cattle that include dairy genetics make up something in the neighborhood of 25% of the U.S. beef supply. With improvements in the utilization of male sex beef bull semen, many dairymen are choosing to utilize beef genetics to add value to their calf crop. On March 10th, Al Gaylor, Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Sandusky County, presented via Zoom during the OSU Extension Beef Team's 2021 Winter Beef School Series on making beef cattle sire decisions for the dairy herd. Al covered EPDs and traits to consider in order to maximize the value and marketability of crossbred beef on dairy calves. Listen in as OSU Extension Beef Field Specialist Garth Ruff introduces Al Gaylor as he discusses utilizing beef sires to add value to the dairy-based calf crop. Thanks for joining us here at the lunch hour uh, to talk about a topic that's certainly gaining traction uh, not only amongst dairy producers as we look to add value to our dairy calves specifically those bull calves and, and manage the hef dairy heifer population here um, in Ohio and really uh, across the U.S. Um, so I was going to talk about beef sire selection for the dairy herd. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, there's certainly a lot of thoughts and opinions on how to approach this. Uh, but hopefully we, uh, by the time Al's done here today, come up with some questions and uh, maybe some answers as to what the best approach is as we look at uh, breeding those dairy females to some beef sires. So with that, Al Gaylor, um, Extension Educator, Ag Natural Resources in Sandusky County is our speaker today. Al? Okay, thanks, Garth. Just a brief overview on what I'm going to go through and, and cover. And the main focus of the talk is going to be looking at what we need to find in a beef sire to utilize in that beef on dairy situation. Uh, a big component of that is, of course, EPDs or expected progeny differences. And I won't spend a lot of time getting into specific details on learning what those traits are, but that's something that definitely producers are going to want to do their homework on. We've got some really good talks actually recorded from previous meetings this year uh, on our beef team library that we can get good explanation of those traits and how to understand them. Uh, but I will refer to some, some basics on some of those here today. Uh, the other thing is just developing uh, priority on what traits are the most important to look for beyond those EPDs uh, and what we need to find in a beef bull to have uh, success with utilizing uh, crossbred calves for whatever market we may find. Uh, we'll look at what breeds then might offer those specific traits and uh, EPDs that might be desirable and uh, maybe some breeds to avoid using in specific situations as not all dairy cows are made the same. Um, and then I'm gonna move into just a, a brief take on my perspective, um, which is certainly not as a dairy producer or even a dairy specialist by any means, uh, but kind of as a, uh, um, participant in the beef industry and uh, with my knowledge on that side, what I think a, a strategy might look like for marketing these calves, uh, depending upon what our retention strategy is and our replacement effort strategy within our dairy herd. And then putting that all together to develop a breeding plan of how we're going to mate those cows, how many we're going to mate to beef semen, if we're going to utilize sex semen, and how all that's going to affect our bottom line ultimately as that's our number one goal and, and the main reason for looking at utilizing beef on dairy is to get some increased revenue back to that dairy operation. So what traits do we wanna look at? Well, uh, first and foremost, we need to look at things that are going to be an advantage from using a beef sire. So what, what, uh, what traits are already out there within the dairy breeds that we maybe don't need to focus on as much. And as most anyone in, in either the beef or dairy industry knows, the marbling and quality grade coming out of virtually any dairy beef animal or dairy beef cross animal uh, is gonna be better than average. Uh, Jerseys are one of the highest marbling breeds of cattle in the world today. Uh, Holsteins come in not far behind that. And there's tons of different research projects out there that can uh, be accessed to look at 
and just see how all these different breeds line up. But there's general consensus out there that as we go down the line right here with what you're seeing uh, on my screen, that we have no concerns in developing marbling and quality of carcasses. Uh, what we're gonna be looking at then is trying to find other traits that are gonna give us an advantage. So we've certainly got some breeds that can be utilized uh, to maintain that marbling, uh, but not a, not a huge concern. One thing we uh, also look at is that in today's industry, the packers do not seem to mind big carcasses. Years ago, we used to hear talk of discounts for carcasses that were too big and didn't fit the box. Uh, but with our, our mass production today and the way the beef industry is handling uh, even all a lot of the Holstein carcasses, size does not seem to be much of a limiting factor. So the Holstein carcasses do bring that to the table for us. Um, but on the opposite side of that spectrum, we have Jersey carcasses that a lot of times are often too small. Um, so that's one of the places that uh, we might look to make some changes when we're crossbreeding Jersey dairy cows is what we can do to increase that carcass size and make it more desirable uh, for the end point in the industry. Uh, feed efficiency is another one that we fall short on in within the dairy breed that here's where we can really get an advantage with the crossbreeding with specific beef breeds to take advantage. Uh, on average, we can, we can expect two, two and a half to three pounds of average daily gain with Holstein cattle on feed and a feed conversion ranging somewhere from that seven and a half to eight and a half pounds of feed per one pound of gain, where we compare that to long-term averages over several beef breeds, we can expect the gains up to four and a half and sometimes even greater than that in highly managed feedlots with good genetics. Uh, but what's really more telling of the story here that's gonna have a bigger effect on the bottom line is finding those ones that can complement the dairy breeds because of the added feed conversion and lowering that number of only four and a half to seven and a half pounds of feed per pound of gain, which with the cost of commodity prices today, certainly is gonna have a large impact on that bottom line for us. Um, and then as we see on the, the bottom line there, I, I think I missed a, a section there or a point that we, I was talking Jersey, um, we don't really know what those long-term average daily gains are. There's a lot, not a lot of data out there uh, to tell us what that feed conversion might be, uh, what we can expect. It would be similar, but more than likely uh, in most of the research that I can gather, it's gonna be a little bit less than Holstein's on both the average daily gain and the feed conversion. So definitely some room for improvement there as well that the uh, beef traits can bring to the table for us. What other beef traits do some of the dairy breeds fall short on? Well, I already mentioned this one, uh, carcass weight in terms of the Jersey carcasses and maybe some other smaller dairy breeds. The packers certainly don't mind taking those large carcasses on. Uh, typically today, we still look at that 600 to 900 pound carcass range. And a lot of Jersey carcasses, if we're feeding purebred Jersey steers are gonna come in under that and several Holstein hot carcass weights are gonna come in over that 900 pound range. Uh, so we can look at that. The other thing is to look at muscling. And this is where we really fall short a lot of times in dairy cattle on feed for beef production. And that magical number of 11 square inch ribeye areas is sometimes hard to beat or hard to meet, especially with Jersey carcasses. Uh, Holstein carcasses, Averages come in just under that on, on most data that I've been able to gather, but we have definite room for improvement there. And that's certainly one place where we can look to that crossbreeding with beef sires to increase that muscling and overall yield on these carcasses. As we're looking through, what other traits do we need to think about besides just looking at those few traits that, uh, that one breed seems to excel in or be shortfall in uh, when we're looking at this crossbreeding situation. Uh, one of the things we can consider is birth weight and calving ease. Um, in talking to some dairy farmers as I put this together, that is still uh, one thing at the, not the top of their mind, most mating decisions being made in the dairy herd are looking to uh, improve milk production, obviously, 
and uh, see what they can do for the, the best part of their bottom line in that regard. And sometimes they sacrifice in birth weight and calving ease. Uh, but there are still a lot more assisted calvings and calving problems than most dairymen would care to take the time to deal with. So we may be able to help that problem as well. And in specific cases, uh, we may select for it. In some cases, we may not need to, but that option is there within several of our beef breeds uh, to bring some calving assistance uh, with lighter birth weights. Weaning weight and yearling weight, depending on our marketing strategies and what we're gonna do with resulting crossbred calves, uh, these may be important traits to us. If we are simply gonna market calves at, as newborns, uh, it may not be as much of a concern to us, but depending on how much follow through we have, if we have any retained ownership or if we're going back to get carcass data or if we are selling directly and wanna work with the same buyers year in and year out and get a specialized market that we can command higher prices, we're probably gonna to wanna to think about these kind of production traits so that we can ensure that we're, we're sending high growth cattle out to whatever destination, whether that be feedlot backgrounder uh, or other. Size and stature, and this is a big one to me, uh, as you're gonna see as we get into talking about EPDs here in the next couple of slides, but looking and finding the right match to whatever dairy breed we're crossing with uh, and finding the right beef breed that can complement uh, the size and stature as we look at heterosis and what we can do here. Um, we don't necessarily need to be breeding Holsteins to seven frame uh, terminal type bulls that are gonna just give us that continued uh, high frame, uh, longer growth period type of offspring, we can, we can do some mixing and matching here to come up with moderate size uh, and scale and get the proper growth rates, proper maturity rates as well. And I think this might have as much to do with it as anything, especially just comparing uh, to genomics, but we'll talk about those here in a minute. And then um, one other consideration, uh, as anyone who frequents the, the Stockyards uh, anywhere knows that hide color does sometimes make a difference. Is it uh, a decision that we need to put at the forefront of our selection criteria when looking for a beef sire to use in our dairy herds? I don't think so, but sometimes uh, if we are gonna be, for instance, marketing feeder calves and uh, getting those calves weaned off of the buckets and on feed before we market them as a dairy producer, uh, in that instance, especially going to the stockyards, it may make uh, somewhat of a difference here. And uh, there are several options out there, of course, to get to go after to get that usually sought after black colored hide when we're going to the stockyards. As I mentioned, uh, taking a look at EPDs and what the next few slides are going to show are some screenshots of some EPDs of uh, some bulls that represent some extremes within the Angus breed. And I, I pulled slides from the Angus breed uh, just because that's the standard. If you look at the crossbreed EPD adjustment factors, uh, everyone knows that uh, Angus is used as the benchmark for that. And uh, as I mentioned, we've got really good talk done earlier this year by John Grimes talking about EPDs and understanding of all of that and, and how to utilize some of those things. Uh, so some additional research and, and homework may be necessary for the dairy producer to understand how to select a sire, a beef sire based on these, but there are adjustment factors that we can use so that we're looking at apples to apples when comparing different breeds to select. But we're going to look at uh, a few different Angus bulls that might represent the extreme. And this is uh, maybe a point that, that I think is really important to make uh, most times. And if you listen to um, representatives from a lot of the AI stud services, they've got what a lot of times they pick out as ideal bulls to be using in this beef on dairy scenario. And the number one criteria that they seem to select for is carcass merit. And so they want to pick out what they have deemed as their carcass bulls that are not selected for phenotype. Uh, they are not necessarily selected uh, for any visual trait uh, or necessarily calving ease or any of the maternal traits like you see here at the top of the screen. But if you move down here where my pointer is at to these carcass traits, this is what they focus on. And what, what you're looking at here is for each one of these traits such as carcass weight, which is the CW, marbling, ribeye area, and then fat, the top number is the actual EPD 
uh, assigned by the Angus Association um, through the National Cattle Evaluation. And then the second line with the decimals is the accuracy. So as producers turn in more data on offspring of this particular bull, that accuracy number will continue to climb and it is considered more highly accurate, especially once we get up above that 0.5 mark. Uh, but highly proven bulls will be up uh, significantly higher than that even. But still a good predictor even at uh, these lower accuracy numbers overall. And then the bottom number here is a percentage ranking within the Angus breed of where this bull falls. So this is what we would consider a true carcass bull here because he's in the top 1% of the Angus breed for both the marbling and the ribeye area EPDs, meaning that he, his offspring uh, would expect it to perform better than the offspring of 99% of all the other Angus bulls uh, included in the evaluation. And then he's at 15% for both carcass weight and fat. And of course that fat, we're looking for the lower number because what we're trying to determine there is the bulls that can, can have high marbling, but lower external fat. So this is one of those bulls that represents the extremes of uh, being a carcass bull. You can look up at his growth numbers and see that uh, for birth weight, he's low. For weaning weight and yearling weight, he's still near the top of the breed. Uh, but what we're really focusing on here and what is termed a lot of times as the carcass bull, um, what I think we need to look at is simply finding more balance. But this is one option out there, depending on what type of mating we wanna make and how we're gonna market those calves to go through and select to continue to improve on those carcass traits. Uh, but to me, depending on that scenario, we might wanna focus more on the carcass weight uh, and maybe on the ribeye area versus the marbling, because as we already discussed at the beginning, that marbling trait is gonna carry through quite well for most of our dairy breeds. So we need to find ways to select for the muscle and maybe um, the external fat consideration as well. Uh, but uh, a good representation here of what uh, an option to be for what we call a carcass bull within the beef industry. Uh, another option is that uh, sometimes may be included by some of the references from our AI stud organizations is what they consider their growth bulls. And here we just focus strictly on the production traits such as weaning weight, yearling weight. Um, here we also have traits that I think are important to look at when selecting for beef on dairy, yearling height and mature weight and mature height. And uh, why do we consider that? Well, what is one of the issues with feeding purebred Holstein steers? Um, we have to get them oftentimes to 1700 pounds because they bring so much frame to the table uh, and extend that growth curve out with a slower rate of growth. So we can improve on that if we look at um, numbers such as our yearling weight and fine bulls that are in the upper echelon here, such as this bull who's in the top 4% of the Angus breed for yearling weight, top 10% of the breed for weaning weight, um, and still in the top 20% for birth weight, which tells you this bull is expected to sire calves that are gonna come out light, but they're gonna take off and grow uh, extremely well towards weaning and continue to improve on that growth rate as they approach yearly. Um, one of the things that I would caution as we look at these growth bulls though in selecting for beef on dairy is looking at the yearling height and then uh, it falls under the maternal category, but the mature height EPD, we do not necessarily need to be selecting, especially for use on Holsteins, bulls that are in the upper echelons of the breed for the mature height or the yearling height EPD. Uh, we are gonna have frame present from that Holstein mating. Now, on the other end of that spectrum, if we're mating to Jersey cows, we may uh, not need to worry about this as much and uh, be concerned more with other traits, but we do not ne necessarily need to be adding frame, uh, which we'd be doing by selecting bulls that are uh, above breed average for both yearling height and mature height. Next category is just what I call the realistic bulls that we probably need to be giving the most consideration, consideration no matter what dairy breed we're gonna be utilizing for beef on dairy. And by realistic, I just mean common sense, balanced trait bulls, uh, bulls that are somewhere near, near or slightly above breed average for what's gonna be most important to us as a dairy producer. Uh, so if 
calving knees and getting those calves to come out light and small is a concern because we do not have time uh, or labor available. Then looking at bulls that are in this calving knees and birth weight category below breed average, which this one is below or above breed average. And this one is above for calving knees, but slightly below breed average at the 60th percentile for birth weight. But if you look across, uh, this bull represents good balance because he's not in uh, the top 10 or even 20% for several traits, but is above breed average for several traits. Uh, and of course, below breed average for some, which you would expect uh, in a balanced trait bull. Uh, balanced carcass numbers, and in this particular instance, uh, one of those carcass numbers being marbling is in the 95th percentile. So this bull is not one of the better bulls in the Angus breed for marbling, but again, a trait that we may not necessarily want to make a high selection priority uh, in this scenario. We're more interested with carcass weight, uh, ribeye, and fat content, which is very, very well balanced there. Another trait that I think we really need to look at that I think is underutilized in the beef industry and especially in these crossbreeding scenarios of putting beef on dairy is the dollar energy EPD. And this represents um, a complex formula with uh, feed intake and tries to give us an understanding of how much money it's gonna cost uh, to feed the offspring of this bull. And you can see at a negative nine, this bull is in the top 40%. And we also have a, a direct correlation here with the milk EPD. You can see this bull is well below, almost to the bottom of the breed in his milk EPD, which doesn't mean that his daughters are not gonna be able to milk at all. It just means that if given the right inputs, um, there's a lot of other bulls whose offspring could milk significantly higher, uh, but there's correlation here. And a lot of times when we look at those extreme growth sires like I had on the previous slide, they also come with extremely high milk EPDs. And what that means is it's gonna take significantly higher inputs to get those offspring of that bull to express their genetic potential in terms of milk production that's gonna to relate to the growth of that calf. If we have great feed resources available at a reasonable price, it's certainly a trait we can take advantage of to get that growth. Uh, but in, in another instance, such as comparing it with dollar energy, we typically see lower milk bulls that have a better rating for dollars energy. Uh, and a lot of times that's associated with dry matter intake as well. This particular bull is only in the 80th percentile for dry matter intake. Uh, but if we can get bulls that are up in the top half or even top 25% of the breed for dollar energy, they are usually easier flushing type cattle uh, that will perform quite well in a feedlot and uh, do what we need to do in terms of this beef on dairy where we need to be able to get them at a quicker maturity pattern, still get the pounds of gain that we need, uh, but to do it with less input and increase that feed efficiency. So one that I really think we can, uh, if, as we come to understand it and learn about it, one that, a trait that we can certainly utilize uh, in our criteria selection. So when we put all of that together, what we need to really do is start to figure out the best scenario for combining these traits and looking at the individual dairy herds desires, uh, what their feed resources are for the calves as a result of this mating, what their labor resources are uh, in terms of monitoring for dystocia and putting that all together, I think we need to, to come back to figuring out that what I called the realistic bulls and those balanced trait bulls. And it doesn't matter what breed we're looking at. If we find the ones that have the balanced traits, uh, those are typically going to be the wider body bulls, the sounder structured bulls, the ones that are uh, at breed average or below for birth weight and milk, uh, but yet breed average or above for weaning weight, yearling weight and dollars energy. And when we find those type of bulls, then we can go back and look at the physical specimen and evaluate phenotype and uh, do exactly what these top couple of points talk about. We need to consider uh, structural integrity uh, when we make these matings. A lot of times in the dairy industry, I think we get can get hung up on selection for milk production and uh, trying to chase the dollar that way. And we sometimes lose structural integrity. Uh, that's one place that if we're gonna breed to a beef bull to try to take advantage of a market, we might as well try to find ones that have good feet and legs, 
that are sound jointed uh, with the proper angles that we know those cattle will survive because they're likely going to be on a concrete surface uh, for majority of their life uh, in a feedlot situation. So having that sound structure there and just getting wide body dense made cattle that have the capacity and volume to convert uh, and improve that feed efficiency that we talked about at the beginning. So really need to, to take into account everything on this slide and uh, look at those specific traits across whatever breed. And then when we're selecting that breed, we may want to go back and consider things as mentioned earlier, such as hide color uh, and specific traits that one breed might offer from the beef side to complement whatever dairy breed we are breeding to, such as my last point here for jerseys, we may want to consider looking to find one that is above average on that carcass weight uh, trait. And there's a lot of interesting data and research out there. I came across a really neat article uh, about a project uh, up in Minnesota where they were breeding limb flex and limousine bulls to in their uh, dairy Jersey herd uh, in order to try to increase carcass merit and uh, increase growth rate. And just one uh, specific instance of a mating that uh, a system has worked out well and uh, complemented both breeds to come together and make a uh, very usable end product for the beef industry. And uh, we could sit and certainly sit and talk all day uh, about what the ideal mating is, but uh, it, it again depends on that situation for the dairy farmer and how they're gonna market those calves. Uh, if we need to increase uh, calving ease, if we need to look at feed efficiency, moderation of size, of course, coming back to our British breeds, is going to be one of the quickest ways to do that in this crossbreeding scenario with breeds like Angus and Hereford. If uh, we simply need to increase muscle and growth and potentially carcass yield, uh, obviously our, our terminal type or dual purpose breeds uh, of Charlet and Limousine and then that uh, often viewed dual purpose Semitol breed that uh, can bring several different traits to the table. And of course, each one of these breeds um, is oftentimes combined with Angus or another British breed to create combination trait breeds such as the Sem Angus or the Limflex or even the Murray Gray, which is a cross of the Angus and the Shorthorn breed that may have some merit uh, to utilizing depending on the breed and the scenario for the dairy producer. To me though, uh, we need to really figure out, uh, we, can, we can spend a lot of time on both figuring out what that ideal breed is, and maybe it's multiple breeds uh, within one dairy herd. If we have a Holstein herd uh, that we're gonna breed a certain percentage of our cows to beef, uh, maybe we wanna try a few different uh, breeds and represent some different uh, scenarios in terms of trait selection. Uh, but to me, before we can figure that out, and get that ideal scenario uh, of understanding what, what we're gonna do with these calves. We need to come up with an overall herd goal and marketing plan uh, for heifer retention. Are we gonna retain any at all? Um, how many heifers do we need to keep on an annual basis to keep our herd the size it is? Or are we gonna try to increase the size of our dairy herd uh, with expansion by keeping more heifers? Are we taking a good hard look at what it takes for us to raise and develop those heifers to put back in the herd, or is there opportunity somewhere to purchase replacement heifers that might give us a better rate of genetic improvement than keeping heifers from with our own herd, uh, and might be able to do that at a cheaper cost than developing those heifers ourselves, which in that case would certainly open up opportunity for more beef on dairy breeding and allow us to take more advantage of the market opportunities there. Uh, there's certainly opportunity cost with everything that we're doing and every decision we make. Um, so we've really got to figure out uh, what is that number of cows bred versus heifers kept that we're, we are currently experiencing, uh, and what is the value of calves that are not kept as replacements. Um, for the, the scenarios that I'm going to present to you here over the next few slides, uh, I'm going to assume that most dairies are in that situation of continuing to keep their own replacements versus purchasing all of them. Um, and we need to be able to figure out what that value is of all the calves that they are not putting back into the herd before we can go and make the right sire selection to try to improve on that bottom line scenario. Uh, we also need to do an evaluation of the, our current use of that calf crop, which goes right along with that uh, 
uh, figuring out what those calves are, are what we're going to do with those calves that we're not putting back into the herd. So uh, understanding if we're using all conventional semen, what is our average ratio? Are we averaging 50-50 ratio on bulls and heifers? We need to know how many of each we're going to have available to sell before we try to determine that market and then go back and make appropriate mating decisions. How many of those heifers are we keeping um, and when are we going to sell those remaining calves? Are we going to treat them as we have our dairy calves, uh, get them into a, a bucket scenario right away and get them to either the stockyards or a direct market within a few days after birth? Are we going to try to get those calves on grain and weaned off the bucket at three or four months of age? Uh, or are we going to feed them longer to make yearlings out of them? Uh, are we going to feed them as two-year-olds that we might be able to sell as replacement heifers to another dairy herd, uh, which certainly is a scenario that may work out for some specific herds. But we need to understand what that plan is to know how many calves we're going to have and of what type before we market them. And then where are we going to take them? Are we marketing everything through the auction barn? Do we have feedlots that we can direct market to? Uh, or is it going to be trying to market all of our heifer calves to other dairies? And then finally, uh, determining your overall position in the supply chain before we get into some of the scenarios of what this might look like for us. Um, are we selling them all as uh, freshening two-year-olds? Uh, are we going to try to be a yearling replacement um, supplier? Uh, maybe we're going to get into freezer beef and try to keep all of the calves that we're not going to put back into the herd ourselves uh, and develop them and sell them in a niche market as freezer beef which certainly would have an effect on how we're going to determine that beef sire mating. Uh, are we going to sell them as commercial fat cattle and take them to the stockyards after we finish them uh, or sell them uh, on a contract basis? Or are we going to look at that uh, weaned feeder calf and try to get them to that 300 to 600 pound range before we find a market uh, or as newborns? And I think the key here is figuring out what works for us and specializing in that to try to do the best we can at taking advantage of whatever market scenarios are available in our specific area uh, or that we might have access to. And if we can specialize there, we might be able to do the most improvement on our bottom line then by going back to find the appropriate breed and trait selection of what type of beef sire to utilize. So I've put together just a couple scenarios and, and this is where I say, keep in mind, uh, this is just uh, me brainstorming uh, as an extension educator with a little bit of knowledge of the dairy industry and also uh, in my knowledge and background in the beef industry, uh, looking at some scenarios that maybe uh, specific dairies would be looking at. Uh, so for all these scenarios, <coughs> I'm going to assume that we're looking at a 100 cow herd just for easy numbers and easy math, uh, that we're going to need a 30% replacement rate to keep enough heifers coming back into the operation uh, so that we don't have to purchase replacement females. Uh, in this particular scenario one, we're, we're going to use 100% conventional dairy semen to breed these cows. And so we're going to expect a 50% heifer calf crop. Um, and we're going to need to develop 40 of those in order to end up with our 30% replacement rate. I did not get into fine tuning every one of these scenarios to include uh, death loss uh, and a lot of other risk factors we may have. We're just looking at broad numbers. Uh, to generate some ideas and kind of get us thinking along the line of how we can establish this market so that we can then work backwards to go into that beef sire selection. Um, so in this particular instance, we would have uh, about 10 heifers and 50 bull calves to market uh, with this particular scenario. And what I've done then is looked around uh, Ohio auction prices uh, over the last four months and averaged those together, which gave us this chart here to just see what would the difference in our income be if those 10 heifer calves and those 50 bull calves that we are marketing were crossbred with beef sires versus selling them as dairy calves. And of course, the most readily available information out there is, is on Holsteins. Uh, so that's the comparison that we're looking at here. And if you look uh, down over um, specific instances of prices paid at the Mount Hope auction, and this is average from one specific sale date, you can see the bottom line here is what the average is of those top four. So this is an average of the last four months. And then the bottom line <coughs> is the overall average of those. So on average at the Mount Hope auction, um, prices paid 
four, and this is 90 to 120 pound calves, uh, typically in that three to five range, three to five day old range, uh, Holstein bull calves commanded an average of $144 per head, whereas their crossbred counterparts averaged $177 per head. So a $33 advantage there on the bulls and the heifers is what really tells the story here in what we can expect from an advantage on those crossbred calves. Heifers, Holstein heifers only average $55 per head versus 179. The crossbred heifers actually outsold the crossbred bulls over the last four months by just a couple of dollars. So if we multiply that out by those 10 heifers and 50 bulls that we're gonna have, you can see $1,650 there in a crossbred advantage on bulls and $1,240 on just 10 heifers uh, that we're producing. So that right there uh, on just the 100 cow herd might be enough for some dairy farmers to take a look at, especially those that are selling uh, at this young age and not feeding those calves at all on their operation. Uh, passing that risk on and getting a nice little benefit on their bottom line because they have crossbred calves to offer. Next scenario uh, looking at is including all those same assumptions, but now and rather than sell those heifers as newborns, we are going to uh, market those calves as feeders. So I just plugged in an average weight of 350 pounds for these calves and uh, pulled prices at Miskeem livestock uh, throughout uh, two, 2021 sales and average prices together here. And at that 300 to 400 pound range, uh, we came up with an average price on Holstein steers at $1.03 a pound, crossbred steers $1.46 and crossbred heifers $1.31. We plug in a $350 weight for each of these. And uh, you can see that we have a significant advantage for crossbreeding here as well uh, with bulls at an average of $150. Uh, and we still have, we're going to assume that those heifer calves um, were sold at uh, a few days old in this scenario. So we still are back to that same um, $124 uh, on those as we saw in our previous slide. But going back to that previous slide, remember we were at $1,650, just $33 per head of an advantage on the crossbred bulls. But if we keep those calves and develop them and get them weaned off of the bucket on the grain, we could see upwards as much as $7,500 in increased value. Now, obviously there's gonna be a price tag for feed in there that we're gonna to have to sit down on an individual basis and figure out the feed costs available or the feed inputs available and what those costs are uh, on an individual farm but the, the potential for significantly more uh, advantage by having that crossbred calf could be realized by uh, taking them up to that three to 400 pound range before marketing. The next scenario I've got is if we're gonna keep those cattle uh, on the farm and we're gonna finish them all the way through as fat cattle. Uh, and again, we're still looking at getting rid of those 10 heifer calves at birth uh, as there's just no market for uh, those calves established uh, as Holstein or dairy heifers uh, at a, a weaned feeder calf age or as fats as most of those would go on to be sold as dairy replacements. So we're going to assume that those 10 heifers left over after we retain our 30 are going to be marketed uh, as newborns and keep the, the dollar value the same there. But if we have 50 bulls that we're going to sell as fat cattle, <coughs> plugging in an average weight on the Holstein bulls at 1600 and the crossbred steers at 1,400 and crossbred heifers at 1,200 pounds with the average prices paid uh, over the course of uh, the last two months here in 2021, you can see that we still have a significant advantage there. We've added another $400 to the uh, overall herd revenue on those bulls by gaining another $8 per head with that crossbred advantage by having bulls that hopefully we're able to um, be more efficient in terms of feed, uh, probably less days on feed and, uh, and figure into that advantage. Uh, and we're just looking at that overall endpoint value here. So there's a lot of different numbers that can come into play there, depending on how many days we do have them on feed, what the available feed uh, to us is and what those costs are. And again, that's where I say we're going to have to do some homework 
and work through this on an individual basis to figure out exactly what this number that equates to 7,900 here uh, on, a, on a blank slate is for an individual operation, but there's certainly opportunity for that cross broad advantage to be, to be taken if we are gonna put cattle on feed and keep them ourselves. So how do we make that scenario work? Um, we've got to come up with a plan uh, in order to get those 50 bull calves as crossbreds and see if we can get some of our heifers as crossbreds to market this way. And depending on what we decide our position in the supply chain is going to be, we would change uh, this particular scenario that I have on this screen here uh, to, to reflect that. Uh, obviously, it's not a cookie cutter design for any one operation. But if we're going to sell all of our calves as newborns, we might want to make some changes to the numbers I have here. Uh, but for instance, just as a sample plan, if we were to take advantage of sex dairy heifer semen, we could take the top 30 indexing cows in our dairy herd and breed those to sex dairy heifer semen so that we produce our replacement heifers out of the very best cows in our herd and further our genetic advancement rather than breeding all of our cows to conventional semen and taking a chance on keeping heifers that may not be near the top of the herd in terms of genetic performance. We would then go and breed uh, maybe 10 cows to conventional dairy semen because just breeding 30 cows uh, to sex dairy heifer semen you know is not necessarily gonna result in 30 heifers to keep. So we need to have some overflow there to make sure we have 30 heifers to select from. So I've just plugged in an extra 10 cows to breed the conventional dairy semen and then the remaining 60 cows in the herd, we could breed to sexed beef bull semen to not only give us that crossbred advantage, but give us the advantage of having bull calves, whether we're going to market those at birth or whether we're going to market those as feeder calves or whether we're going to uh, cut them and put them into a feedlot on our own. We can certainly see the advantage uh, through some of these numbers on having that, that crossbred bull calf uh, to turn into a steer. So we could use matings like this to come up with that scenario of getting us those 50 bulls to market, but having the very best genetics to return to the herd by utilizing that sex dairy semen. Of course, that does come with an added cost as well. Uh, on average, uh, we can expect sex dairy semen premium to be about $30 extra per straw. Uh, so there's gonna be some costs to breeding those top 30 cows to that, that semen and added cost of $1,200. Uh, and then the, on the beef side, <clears throat> whether it's female semen or bull semen, there's an average uh, of around $20 of added cost per straw to get that sexed beef semen. So we're adding in another $1,000 there. But most of the scenarios that we have just worked through would certainly readily absorb this added semen cost and be realized uh, in that bottom line figure if we were able to take advantage of not only the crossbred scenario, uh, but having bull calf, crossbred bull calves uh, as well uh, to put into that marketing plan. And again, here's a, diff here's a place where every individual scenario is gonna be a little bit different. We first got to develop what our plan is for our specific farm, how we can best market those calves uh, to have the biggest impact on our bottom line. And that's gonna depend on things like what facilities we have available, what feedstuffs we have available and what the cost of those are. And that's where we have a great resource uh, in all of our OSU extension team through both our beef team and our dairy team and a lot of specialists that have the tools uh, and the knowledge to figure out that individual scenario with each operation. But there's certainly some merit here to utilizing uh, the trait selection and finding the right breed and type of sire to utilize to come up with crossbred calves that can definitely help us improve our overall operation in terms of revenue. So some closing thoughts to put together on all of this stuff then is simply do your research as a producer. And I know uh, as a dairy farmer, extra time is not something we have a lot of, uh, but taking that time uh, to sit down and there is just tons and tons of good university and privately done research out there on what matings are the best in terms of breeds that complement each other for the beef on dairy uh, and figuring out what traits would best work to complement the current traits that you have in your dairy herd in order to get the most marketable type of beef crossed calves. 
Um, and then sharpen that pencil, get out the calculator, take off your socks and mittens if you need to, uh, but start crunching some numbers to really figure out what it is in terms of costs for you to put replacement heifers back into your herd. Also figure out what it is in terms of what it takes for um, buying replacements, if that could possibly be a cheaper scenario for you uh, than raising them, or maybe it's um, a combination of that so we can take advantage of outside genetics as well as keeping our top producing genetics and narrowing that number from 30 down to 10 or 15 that we breed to sex dairy semen. Um, looking also at the cost of developing feeder calves, it's potentially a possibility, depending on the facility, that it might be cheaper to uh, or more cost effective to develop those feeder calves and sell them as weaned calves uh, off of the bucket rather than as newborns and increase our bottom line that way. <clears throat> or if we have the facility and we have the feedstuffs available, what would it take uh, to go ahead and finish those calves and market and take advantage of that crossbred? Uh, advantage in terms of dollars of value of that finished animal. Uh, and of course, we all need to be able to figure out what our facility costs are in all of this before we can do diligence to our, our own operation and figuring out the best marketing scenario. Um, but once we do, we identify that market and we establish our own position in the supply chain. Um, and here again, I would recommend that we try to specialize in that position. Once we figure out the best place that makes sense in terms of dollars, we can definitely give ourselves the best overall economic advantage by taking advantage of that specialization and whether that's selling newborn calves, selling feeder calves, finishing fat cattle, or maybe it uh, we realize that it's in dairy replacements and we do not need to even utilize the beef cross system. But whatever our facilities and our inputs will allow us, we need to utilize them to their fullest potential uh, to get that best effect on our bottom line overall. Uh, another point that I really wanna stress is we need to negotiate, whether that's with the direct marketing of our calves, whether that's making bulk feed purchases uh, that we can combine uh, feed purchases with neighbors or other elements of our operation uh, or purchasing in bulk versus bag. Uh, and then finally on sex semen price. I, uh, I think that there's definitely some negotiation power there as well. Uh, just knowing about the beef industry and the sex semen process, uh, the highest demand within the beef industry for sex semen is on the female side, just like on the dairy side in most cases. And I think that there's probably some negotiating power with the AI studs that supply this sex semen. Um, if you're going to buy in specific quantities that you could probably get your hands on sex male semen on average cheaper than sexed female semen and certainly be able to get them to work with you on those prices. It doesn't hurt to ask up front because I think there are some quantities, especially on specific balanced trait bulls that I think we need to be selecting for in this beef on dairy cross that are not in high demand. Most of the high demand sex semen in the beef industry is gonna be for those extreme bulls, whether that's extreme on the growth side, extreme on the carcass side, uh, or bulls that do the best of all, everything, uh, we can find a lot of those balanced trait bulls that simply don't have uh, the high demand for that sex semen and may be able to do better on price if we find the right people to talk to. Uh, and finally, just be flexible. We need to adapt to changing markets no matter what sector of the agriculture industry we're in. And today that might mean taking advantage of beef on dairy breeding and finding the right sire selection. Tomorrow that might mean uh, raising all replacements uh, or buying all replacements or any one of combination of the above scenarios. So we just need to be flexible and let our pencil and our calculator do the talking for us to find that best scenario for our individual operation. Uh, and then finally, utilize the resources you have. I, I've mentioned several times, we've got great teams of people that have a tremendous knowledge of both the beef and the dairy industry. Uh, and a, a really good information if you're interested in some of those economics on the utilizing sex semen that comes from our e-extension website uh, that's a compilation of uh, input from extension educators all around the country. This particular article here really gets into the dollars and cents of uh, 
utilizing sex semen and whether that will pan out for our operation and taking a really objective look at it. That's all I have for today. I encourage you to utilize these sites and our team of educators to hopefully get the decisions that will do the best for you in making your beef on dairy selections.